Hi everyone, um, I think we'll make a start if that's okay. Um, a very warm welcome to you. Uh, my name is Dan Crossley. I'm Executive Director at the Food Ethics Council. Um, Honoured to be invited to chair the discussion today. So this is um, a, a discussion led by a bigger conversation. Um, and it's around opening the door to gene editing in the UK, farm animals, pets and wild nature. I'm going to say that again because that's a long title, but it's important. Opening the door to gene editing in the UK, farm animals, pets and wild nature. Um, before we before we introduce speakers and, and explain what's happening, just a quick bit of housekeeping um, to say that this event is being recorded uh, and will be shared afterwards. Um, please do, we'd love to make this a participative session. Um, so please, please do join in um, and ask questions as we go through. Um, if you can, if at all possible, please use the Q&A uh, function to ask questions of our speakers. Um, and then Ames, uh, who is with us, will be collecting some of those questions and we'll be putting those to our speakers after we've heard from all of them. Um, before I introduce them, um, just, I guess, a few words of um, from me. So firstly, Food Ethics Council, if you haven't come across us, we are an organisation about bringing people and organisations uh, together to try to address ethical issues around food and farming. So I come at this with a, a slight bias towards food, but I will make sure that we, as part of this discussion, <coughs> excuse me, do talk about pets and wild, wild nature too. Um, the, the door is open, uh, you know, um, with the new Genetic Te Technology Precision Breeding Act um, here in the UK, uh, which is now law. Um, the door is, as I said, is, is definitely open um, and people will have different views on that. So uh, I'd urge you to you know, add comments and questions in as we go along. We'd love to hear from, from whatever your views are on this and on what the, the future uh, opportunities or risks are for this, um, for these suites of technologies. We'd love to hear your comments. Please do treat people with respect. Um, and I'd, yeah, I'd be interested to know how concerned or how excited you are by uh, by the, the, the subsequent, the kind of enactment of this and, and what comes next in the next few years. Um, so the door being open, I, I'm, I'm intrigued in uh, as to what you, different people, participants and speakers think uh, about how wide that door should be, whether we need a security guard, uh, whether we need someone to uh, monitor that door, whether there should be a door stop to keep it firmly open, whether it should be flung open, whether it should be slammed shut. Um, we'll, those, are, those, I guess, is a, is a, a kind of, to use the door analogy, of, I think is important to think about um, yeah, what do we what do we want to let through the door? What don't we? Um, I think the the reason for doing this session now um, is I think it's really timely because even though you know the the actual act is now as I said in law and in place, but at the moment it's still a I think you'd call it a skeletal uh, skeletal act. Um, uh, there's still opportunity to put meat meat on the bones of that. Um, the regulatory process is still being um, still being developed um, and. So there are, I think this is a great space to, I guess, give airing to some of the legitimate questions that weren't, didn't get chance to get aired before, um, to promote a greater understanding of what we might expect, what might happen next, um, and an opportunity for, you know, for greater scrutiny. Um, you know, it's the, the, you know, speaking from my personal perspective, um, I feel like the, you know, the genetic technology bill and then act was pushed through at pace. Um, I would say, you know, uh, too too quickly, um, and there wasn't in my again my take on it was that whatever you think of the the right merits and, and or not of different technologies and different applications, um, that the, the the pace it was pushed through, uh, and the the way the, the how the process was done, um, uh, left lots of questions unanswered, um, and meant that yeah the the there, there wasn't as much analysis of of some of the risks and concerns. Um, and there was a particular, I guess, focus on uh, on on food, perhaps understandably, but actually some of the you know, implications um, beyond farm animals into pets and wild nature are very important too. So I'll say, as I say, I want to come back to those. Um, before I introduce speakers, final thing I'll say is um, again from a food ethics council perspective, um, that we're interested in uh, those. What's what's the problems we're trying to solve, um, but the pra practicalities around what what can and what should we do, all things considered. So for uh, any um, con you know contentious technology or set of technologies, that you know for me the answers uh, should either be uh, no unless certain conditions are met, or yes if certain conditions are met. 
Uh, and I, I, as I said, to come back to my earlier point, I think there, are, there will be a, a spectrum of views, um, I'm sure, on this uh, amongst the participants. Um, but uh, yeah, we'd love to hear kind of constructive questions and challenge and people are already putting, I think, comments and questions in. So um, that's that's my brief intro. Um, as I said, general encouragement to put questions in the Q&A box, please, throughout this. Um, we're going to hear from three uh, great speakers. Um, first of all, in a moment, we're going to hear from Peter Stevenson, uh, Chief Policy Advisor at Compassion and World Farming. Um, uh, he will talk about some of the, I guess, what he sees as some of the, uh, the risks and, and challenges around this. Um, then we'll hear uh, from David, David Bowles, who's uh, Head of Public Affairs and Campaigns at the RSPCA, who will talk a bit about um, some of the, the, pro the, the process and the kind of impacts on um, you know, trading uh, cooperation agreements and about, but also about pets. Um, obviously, RSPC, RSPC has interest in both farmed animals and pets. Um, and then thirdly, we'll hear from Pat Thomas, who is director of Beyond GM and The Bigger Conversation, um, who will talk a bit more about the kind of use of gene editing technologies in conservation. Um, obviously, Pat, former editor of The Ecologist, um, very well qualified to talk about that. So that's the running order. We'll hear from each of them for about so up to 15 minutes each, and I will be strict on that. Um, and then we will open it up for questions. I may put one or two questions to the panel, um, but then Ames will uh, bring in some of your questions from the Q&A box. So please do, um, as I say, add, add in your questions as we go along. So with that, I will first up over, hand over to Peter, who I believe is going to put up a, a couple of slides. Um, so PT, you've got 15 minutes. Um, look forward to hearing what you've got to say. Just <clears throat> getting my slides going. Okay. Um, <clears throat> the the gene editing of animals in the laboratory is already permitted, subject to compliance with the Scientific Procedures Act. What this new act does, the, the, the Genetic Technology Precision Breeding Act, is allow gene edited farm animals and their progeny to be used in English farms and the, the meat, milk, and eggs from these animals uh, to be sold in, you know, in shops throughout Britain. <clears throat> DEFRA, the government, has reassured us that gene editing is simply a more precise, more rapid form of traditional breeding, such as selective breeding. But if you look at the you know, the immense harm done to farm animal health and welfare over the last 60 years by selective breeding, this, this reassurance that gene editing is just a, a souped up version of selective breeding, it's not reassuring at all, it's very disturbing. And to explain why I'm so concerned about gene editing, I, I need to spend a bit of time looking at the problems caused by selective breeding. Um, today's broilers, the chickens reared for meat, uh, have been bred to grow more than twice as quickly as 60 years ago. They're reaching their slaughter weight of 2.2 kilos in just 35 to 38 days. Now what's growing quickly is the muscle, the meat, uh, the supporting structure of legs, heart, and circulatory system are not able to keep pace with a rapidly growing body. They're not able to properly support it. And as a result, each year in the UK alone, millions uh, of these chickens are suffering from painful leg disorders while others succumb to heart disease. The egg sector is a totally different industry from the meat producing broilers. Um, the red jungle fowl, which is the ancestor of today's laying hens, lays around 20 eggs a year. But today's egg-laying hens uh, have been bred to produce 
over 300 eggs a year. And to do this, they have to draw on their own bone calcium to form eggshells. This leads, leads often to osteoporosis, making these hens very vulnerable to bone fractures. The, the, the Farm Animal Welfare Council, an, an independent body that advises government, has said that it, it's questionable whether it's possible to maintain an output of over 300 eggs a year while attaining sufficient bone strength to reduce this vulnerability to bone fractures. It, in short, we can have healthy hens or 300 eggs a year, but we probably can't have both. <coughs> A cow producing milk for her calf will produce just over a thousand litres in her 10 month lactation. But today's dairy cows have been bred to produce much more. They're producing you know, 10,000, even 12,000 litres a year. Uh, and this causes them immense problems. Uh, in a report for the European Parliament, Professor Donald Broom has said that, you know, cows producing such large amounts of milk have high levels of leg disorders, mastitis, reproductive orders, and that a large proportion of these cows are affected by one or more of these disorders, and the animals live with the poor welfare for a substantial part of their lives. And indeed, after just three or four lactations, many of these cows are utterly exhausted and worn out. Um, and often they're infertile. And an infertile cow can't produce a calf and so can't produce any milk. And so she's prematurely slaughtered. Uh, a worn out milk machine cast aside. Pigs too have been damaged by this drive forevermore. Till a few decades ago, the litter size of a sow would be nine piglets on average, but selective breeding has pushed this up in many countries, including the UK to 14 piglets and in Denmark to 17 to 18. And having such large litters creates health and welfare problems for both the sow and piglets. There's high mortality among the piglets due to low birth weights, variability in birth weights, a, a higher proportion of low viability piglets, and some piglets just starving because they can't access a teat. Unbelievably, we have bred sows uh, that produce more piglets then they have functional teats to feed them with. Um, when you look at all this, as I say, the government's reassurance that this is just like selective breeding, but a bit more precise, is very unreassuring. We're also told that um, gene editing can be used to produce disease resistance in animals. And of course, in the case of diseases that have nothing to do in the, with the way in which the animals are kept, certain tropical diseases, for example, this could be beneficial. But many diseases in farm animals arise from the very poor conditions in which they are kept. Uh, and the proper response to tackling these, these diseases is to improve the conditions for the animals. Um, indeed, conferring gene edited disease resistance uh, on animals could result in them being kept in even more crowded, stressful conditions than these, as they would be immune to the diseases that are inevitable in such conditions. But one 
major defect in this idea of, of gene editing for disease resistance is it tends to presume that viruses are a static ent entity that you can you know edit against it and that's the end of the problem but in fact viruses mutate very quickly and some of the science suggests that in fact these viruses would mutate they would find a way around the gene edited disease resistance and then doing this could become even more virulent. One, I think, really unfortunate uh, example of gene editing is the idea of surrogate sires. This involves taking ordinary, run-of-the-mill male farm animals and gene editing them so that they can no longer produce sperm. Then, uh, sperm producing stem cells from elite animals are transplanted into the ordinary animals so they're able to produce offspring of higher quality than they could have done with their own sperm. To me, this really is treating animals as, as things whose uh, genetic makeup can be you know, tweaked to make them more useful for human purposes. It, it, it's ignoring the fact that they are recognized as sentient beings, indeed recognized as such by law in the UK. If we look then at the details of this new act, yes, it, 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 it provides some protection for animals, but that protection is very, it's couched in very broad terms, and I fear it's going to prove to be flimsy and ineffectual. Someone who wants to use gene-edited animals on, on, on farm has to apply to DEFRA for uh, a marketing authorization, a precision-bred animal marketing authorization. And they submit a declaration saying that you know they they to the best of their knowledge the 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 health and welfare of the gene edited animals and their progeny will not be adversely affected by the traits created by the gene editing and that this application is looked at by a welfare advisory body uh, who provide a report to the secretary of state who decides whether or not to grant a marketing authorization um, but as I say, it's all couched in very broad terms. All the detail will come over the next couple of years in secondary legislation, which in fact, in effect, government gives government a blank check. One of the, the two particular defects that I want to look at. Firstly, the Act makes no attempt to set out what are the factors that the Secretary of State has to consider when deciding whether or not to grant a marketing authorization. Um, but secondly, what's clear is the only factors he can look at are the health and welfare of the, of the particular gene edited animals and their progenies subject to this application. What the Secretary of State can't look at is where is this particular piece of gene editing going to be taken, going to be taking animal farming? What direction is it taking animal farming in? And again, if we look at selective breeding, this is quite, quite disturbing. As I said, pigs have been uh, selectively bred, sows have been selectively bred to have very large litters. This results in the piglets often fighting each other for access to a teat. And in the process of doing so, they can harm each other's faces and the sow's udder. The industry's response to this, rather than going back to a more balanced litter sizes, is to clip the piglet's teeth. That's part of the tooth is cut off. Um, oh, sorry, I've fallen behind my slides. Part of the tooth is, is cut off, even though this is painful, and indeed can cause injuries which can act as a gateway to infections. 
So say, rather than going back to reasonable litigiousness, we just find this painful techno fix. But also some of the surplus piglets are placed on a nurse sow. That's another sow who, whose piglets have just been weaned, but she still has some milk. And so some of the piglets are, are, are placed with her. Now this nurse sow has probably just spent 24 days in a farrowing crate, a crate so narrow she can't even turn around. And now with this new batch of piglets, she's probably going to have to spend another 24 days unable to turn around in a farrowing crate. What we see is that inexorably selective breeding has led to the ramping up of very industrial approaches and attitudes to animal farming. One just keeps becoming ever more industrial. So my big question about gene editing is, you know, is it going to help lead to animals being kept in systems and with practices that, that enable them to enjoy positive welfare and good lives? Or is it going to take us in an ever more industrial direction, possibly ending up with things like these multi-story pig farms in China? Is that our future too? Thank you. I'm looking forward to the questions and discussion. And I'll stop sharing. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, that was perfectly timed and very powerful. So thank you for that, Peter. Um, just on a on a brief point, I think I'm right in saying that um, the chat function for some reason is not working properly um, for for participants. So if you um, would we would just love to hear your views. Do, do please, I think Q&A um, box is, is working. We've already had some kind of comments and a couple of questions in there. So do please use the Q&A box for, um, for any questions or any particular comments you want to um, throw into. We can't get the chat to work, but um, thank you, Peter, for kicking us off. Um, I, hope, so particularly... I hope, Dan, that the chat is working now. Sorry to interrupt. Try again, people, and if not, I'll keep trying. All right, thank you. Um, so we've heard from uh, Peter about uh, sort of the, the the potential for gene editing to uh, entrench or, or even accelerate um, some of the challenges around industrial factory farming. Um, next, we're going to hear from David. Um, so David Bowles, it does, looks like the chat is working, which is uh, encouraging. So do, do add comments in the chat and questions in the Q&A. Um, David hasn't got slides, I think, but David, say, from RSPCA, has been um, working on, on these issues for many years. So, David, over to you, up to 15 minutes. Thank you. Yeah, great. <laughs> Thanks very much, Dan. So, um, uh, what I'm going to talk about is, is three, three different things. Um, you mentioned at the beginning, and Pete has reiterated that, that the, uh, the Precision Be Breeding Act is a skeleton act, um, and I will talk a bit about the process, um, because a lot of the time when when you've been working on a piece of legislation as it goes through the Commons and the Lords, um, most uh, most of the time you then um, take a deep breath and, and step back and think, well, that's my job done. But when you when you've got what are um, skeleton bills where all the action happens in the uh, the implementing regulations. Then you then you shouldn't do that um, because it gives you an, uh, an idea of not only what needs to be done in the future, but also what sort of time set um, is uh, we can expect from this. Now, as as Dan says, this this bill um, now an act went through Parliament pretty rapidly for a piece of legislation. It, it started off um, in the Commons on the twenty fifth of May, twenty twenty two, and got royal assent on the 22nd of March, 2023, which is 10 months just about, um, during which time the uh, the UK went through three prime ministers. Um, so it was, a, it was a, a piece of legislation which was obviously fast-tracked by the government. Um, indeed, the prime minister, um, when he got elected in uh, December, 2019, one of the, the few things that he promised to do on the steps of Downing Street was um, a genetic breeding um, act, um, and uh, and he he fulfilled that. Although obviously he wasn't there when it got royal assent, so it was something that the government fast tracked. Um, it went through all of its stages by October in the Commons, 
Um, and then um, there was a uh, it went through all of its stages in the Lords by February. There was a little there was a little break, um, and then there was a bit of ping pong between the Lords and the Commons, and then it got royal assent. So it it went through pretty quickly. What I, what I'm going to look at is is what is happening now. Um, I will then look at um, what implications does this have. Um, in terms of uh, England, um, because don't forget this act is just an act on England. Um, it is not an act that, um, for those of you that are dialing in from other countries, the UK is a is a devolved country. 80% of our legislation is uh, on animal welfare is devolved. And so therefore it's up to each individual part of the UK, the four parts to decide what they wanna do on, on animal welfare. And this act is, is no different. Um, but the UK also has relations with the EU um, under the Trade and Cooperation Agreement. So what that means for them. Um, and Peter has given a very good overview of the impacts on farm animals. Um, but what we tend to forget is that the definition of animal under this act is, is animal under the Animal Welfare Act. Um, so it includes all vertebrates, not just, um, just, not just farm animals. It includes pet animals. Um, it includes wildlife. Um, and indeed, if the, the Sentience Act, which has just incorporated um, decapod crustaceans and cephalopods, um, has any impact on the Animal Welfare Act, which may well happen in the future, then we may well see crabs, lobsters and squid come under the Animal Welfare Act. And therefore, the Gene um, Editing uh, Act will also apply to those um, non-vertebrates. So it is quite a wide ranging piece of legislation. But let's let's have a look first of all at the at the process. So I I, I totted up um, there and I got to and I may have missed some of some some out, but I got to twelve separate pieces and regulations that will have to be introduced by the Secretary of State um, to to make this this piece of legislation work properly. Um, those those pieces of regulations will provide, as as Peter rightly said, they will provide the nuts and bolts on how the process is going to work. They will provide uh, the evidence ga gathering, the decision making, um, the the enforcement of this piece of legislation, um, and they are they are coming in under a variety of different legislative means. But essentially, what usually happens when you do what is called a statutory instrument. Uh, that is a piece of legislation that comes under the the overarching act, which in this place is the Gene Editing Act. What what tends to happen is um, you can have uh, some debate and some discussion on that within committees in the Lords and the Commons, but it is it's pretty difficult to um, to to amend those statutory instruments when they come in, um, and it's pretty difficult to to actually dismiss those. I think the last time a statutory instrument under negative resolution was dismissed was 1979, which gives you an idea of the of the scale if, if anyone wants to try and um, amend these secondary pieces of legislation as they, they come in. So there is a lot of power uh, resting with the Secretary of State. And, and let's not forget what that power will entail. So Peter rightly said that anyone um, who wants to market a, a, a gene edited product um, will uh, has to apply to the Secretary of State. But before they do that, um, they will presumably have, have manufactured that, that animal, um, gene edited that animal under the Animal Scientific Procedures Act. So there are two pieces of legislation which are working in tandem here. And once that, uh, that uh, animal has been gene edited, it will then be, uh, the, the company will then apply to, uh, to, to the Secretary of State for permission to market that, uh, that product. Then it will go through um, a series of committees. So it will go to an advisory committee. It will then go to a welfare advisory committee, um, which will give advice on its um, health and welfare issues. Um, then there will be a report back to the Secretary of State and then a final decision by the Secretary of State. So there is there is a, 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 a quite a, a complicated and who knows how lengthy that procedure will be, but a procedure that needs to be set up. So things like um, the authorization process needs to go into secondary legislation. Even something like what does the application form look like needs to go into secondary legislation. What are the re requiring and reporting periods will need to be set out in um, secondary legislation? What will be the tests under to as uh, ascertain the health and welfare of that particular um, product uh, and the, the animal that has been produced for that product? They will all have to be laid out 
in secondary legislation. Um, authorization will have to be laid out, including suspension of that authorization. Um, the risk assessments will have to be laid out. Um, and enforcement will have to be laid out. So the inspector system, um, the, the offences, the powers, all of that needs to be sorted out. Um, and in addition to those um, secondary pieces of legislation, there will need to be certain things set up, which don't actually have to be set up in legislation, but they will need to be set up. So there will need to be, the, the Secretary of State will need to uh, set up a register of animals that have been gene edited. The Food Standards Agency, which is in charge of obviously putting food onto the market, will have to set up a register of food that has been approved to go onto the, to the market. Um, there will have to be a, a list, presumably, of, of inspectors. There will have to be people appointed to the uh, Welfare Advisory Committee. So all of those things will need to be set up. And we, to be honest, we have no idea, Dan, um, on the timescales on those. But if you look at 14 different statutory instruments, 14 different secondary pieces of legislation, that is going to take you a while to, to write those. They may well have to be consulted upon, um, even if they're informally consulted upon, and then they will have to go to the Lords and the Commons um, and lay for the, the statutory um, amount of time, which is uh, just over a month, before they, they come into effect. So in my view, um, that will take us probably in well into uh, 2024, probably past the election. Obviously, we don't know when the election is going to be yet in, in the UK, but probably past the election and maybe into 2025. And we, we got some sort of sense of the direction and the timescale when this was debated in the Lords. I'm, I'm sorry to say, but there, there wasn't much um, debate in the Commons. It tended to go through without much say so. But in the Lords, there was there was a fairly good debate on this. And the uh, the, the relevant minister, the DEFRA minister in the Lords, did set out um, uh, some sort of timetable which we can sort of base this on. So he said, for instance, that he didn't expect this would be up and running until 2024, 2025. Um, he didn't expect because uh, obviously this will start off with plants, and Pat's going to cover plants in a minute. That's going to be fast track first of all, um, and farm animals is going to be secondary to plants. He didn't expect animals to be discussed until the uh, the welfare advisory committee was set up and working properly, which may not be until 2026, 2027. Um, and I would imagine farm animals will be the first of those things to come under this procedure. But don't forget, and I go back to what I said at, at the beginning, this is about all animals. So there was discussion in the Lords about pets. Um, we've already had uh, cats that have been cloned. Um, we have already had um, certain animals, uh, pet animals that have been um, gene edited. And the problems that Peter uh, mentioned in relationship to farm animals equally apply to, to pet animals. Um, we, we are all aware of the problems with bracky dogs, um, bracky uh, cats, um, Scottish fold cat being an example, uh, French bulldog being an example, the problems with their breathing, because over the last uh, few generations, say 20 or 30 years, those animals have been bred to look certain ways. The, the snout has got much uh, shorter. The animal therefore has difficulty with breeding, with breathing. So we've already seen those problems, um, just to, just possibly just as severe problems from an animal welfare perspective in pet animals as we have with, with farm animals. And there is nothing to stop a company deciding to gene edit um, a pet animal, a dog, a cat, a rabbit, um, and then put that on to the, the, the market. So that's why... Um, it's important to to not just to focus on plants and farm animals, but also to look at uh, to look at other other um, species such as as pet animals. And lastly, I, I just want to look at um, what's what's the issue and how is this going to work um, within the UK and within Europe? Because this is an England Act. However, um, because the uh, the UK essentially, or certainly Great Britain, essentially has free movement of products throughout its, um, its member states. Those products, it will be very difficult, if not impossible, for those products to be stopped going into Scotland and Wales. So Scotland and Wales have already said that they do not want to uh, gene edit animals in their countries, and they don't particularly want those products to be placed on the market in those countries. However, when the FSA gives authorization and the Secretary of State gives authorization for a gene edited product to be placed on the market in England, 
there, are, there, are, there is no mechanism to stop that under the Internal Markets Act from also going into Scotland and Wales. And also don't forget that Northern Ireland is essentially part of the EU. It's part of the single market, which then leads to the final problem that I'm going to raise, which is how is the UK um, going to work this or England, the English government going to work this with its discussions under the trade and cooperation agreement with the EU? Because when we started off on this journey, the EU was also looking at whether it was going to move down the gene editing route and was seriously considering this. However, in the last couple of months, it's rode back from that. And it is, I think, fairly unlikely that the EU will go down the route of gene edited uh, legislation similar to what um, what England has has just passed, which therefore calls into um, question how are those products um, if are those products once they've been approved in England for for sale and as I said those products will then be automatically approved in Wales and Scotland. How will those products be then? Will they be allowed to go into Northern Ireland, which is part of the EU single market? And also, will they allow, be allowed to go into mainland the EU? Because the EU still treats gene edited products as a GMO, which then means that this really comes under the SPS agreement. And in the trade and cooperation agreement, um, the, the chapter on SPS is, is very clear. That, um, that both countries will follow the, the international rules on um, SPS issues. Now, the tr Trade and Cooperation Agreement is only, uh, it was only adopted um, on the 31st of December uh, 2021. So it's less than um, a, two years into place. Um, but um, I would, I'm doubtful that the EU and the UK have discussed this, um, but I'm sure that the UK, um, the EU will be looking very carefully at how this actually develops in the UK and what products come out of this, particularly food products. Um, and therefore, the first question they'll be asking the UK is, um, how do you stop those leaking across the border into the EU single market where they are not allowed to be marketed? So that's the, those I'm hope have given some food for thought and some questions. Um, and I'm going to hand over now to, to Pat. Thanks, Dan. Thank you, David. Um, just before I hand over to Pat, actually, I'm just going to come back to you, David. One, one quick one, if that's right. It's uh, just, just uh, while you're talking about um, kind of relationship with Europe and what might happen in the developed nations, just very, very briefly, because I'd, I'd say I want to come to Pat, just um, can you say a little bit about what um, other countries, including the EU, are are doing on gene editing? Not not summarise what's happening across the whole world, but is there are there movements across in the EU to um, do anything on gene editing that's, that's relevant for this for this agenda? So so the the there what there was, um, and I I think the the UK when they started off on uh, what well, England when they started off on the on the bill, um, they fully expected the the EU to be jumping at the same time. However, that has not happened, and I I think that the the, the Commission has rode back. Now, obviously, next year we go into an election in the European Union, and we also change the Commission. Uh, so, so who knows, you know, looking forward um, further, who knows what will happen. But at the moment, I think we have two different systems in operation. One in England. In fact, we have three different systems, one in England, one in Scotland and, and Wales, um, where they won't be gene editing, but they will have to be uh, have to be forced to uh, market and sell those products. And then a different system in Northern Ireland as part of the single market and the rest of the EU. Thank you. Thank you. That's really, really helpful. Very clear. Um, we'll come back to the some of the challenges that that presents a bit later, I'm sure, in some of the questions. Um, but next, um, final speaker uh, for now is Pat. So Pat Thomas, um, who will yeah, expand on on what you've heard so far, including um, critically the role of um, yeah, the role of, of nature and uh, so beyond beyond farm animals and pets. Yeah. We are, we are all nature, but uh, getting into sort of wild nature uh, and the implications there. Thank you. Thank you, Dan, and, and thank you to both Peter and David for laying out some of the concerns around the, the complexity, really almost the omni-shambles of the legislative process and the uncertainties around um, the science and the, the consequences of using genetic engineering in animals, because in some way that leaves me free to talk about the, uh, the ethics and some of the philosophical issues around the aspect of the act that has probably had the least amount of exposure. Um, I think all of us on this panel are aware that genetic engineering of living organisms is here. It's not going away, but it remains controversial for a number of 
important and legitimate reasons which extend way beyond the competence of, of simple laboratory science to address. And as such, it requires a much more open dialogue involving a, a diverse range of expertise and what is sometimes referred to as diverse publics. It requires a more thoughtful consideration of how it's used and why it's used and when and where it's used. And that discussion, as, as you've probably heard already, didn't really happen during the passage of the Genetic Technology Act. And as a result, what we have been left with, as, as David quite rightly said, is a skeletal piece of legislation. It's built on a rickety foundation of contested science and unclear language. But the story of this particular legislation has yet to be fully unfolded. So um, as David mentioned, new regulations may or may not come into being at some future point. And so I would caution against either celebrating or falling into despondency just yet. Having said that, some aspects of the act are quite solidly in place. The first of these is its broad scope. So for instance, although the act was, was driven through on a narrative of improving agriculture, there's actually nothing in the act that restricts the environmental release of gene edited technology to agricultural plants and animals. And the range of plants and animals included in the scope is extremely wide. So in terms of plants, it covers the usual agricultural commodity crops, but also trees, grasses, shrubs, flowers, ornamentals, and, and very specifically red, green, and brown algaes. In terms of animals, as both Peter and David have said, the scope extends to all the vertebrates in the metazoa family, except for humans. So mammals, birds, amphibians, reptiles, fish. And this means that the permission to use this technology does extend to wild and free living plants and animals in England. And that developers could, at least in theory, give notice of their intent to do so at any time. Now, it may well be that genetic engineering has something to offer wild nature in the same way that it may have something to offer food production and animal welfare, but we are certainly not there yet. And in the meantime, the unanswered questions are piling up. And given that Science Minister George Freeman has this bold ambition to turn the United Kingdom into what he calls a global test bed, for things like genetic engineering technology, we really should be taking these questions much more seriously. So to give some background, these broad permissions granted in the act are happening within the context of an emerging global conversation spearheaded by the International Union for the Conservation of Nature about the use of genetic technologies to further a whole range of conservation goals including the re-engineering of endangered species to make them more resilient to climate stressors or to bolster populations that are declining due to human encroachment, to control or eradicate, eradicate even, invasive species through the use of gene drives or genetically engineered viruses that can spread traits such as infertility, sex selection or disease resistance through entire populations in the wild to using synthetic biology to replicate substances, blood, oils, and other bodily fluids that we habitually harvest from wild species. And finally, what could best be described as raising the dead, de-extinction or reviving extinct species, such as the dodo, the passenger pigeon, the auric, the Tasmanian tiger, or the woolly mammoth, for purposes that are really not entirely clear. Now, I should say that a lot of these projects still involve the use of older style genetic engineering techniques, though it is only a matter of time before gene editing finds its way into the mix. And the same issues that dog its use in agriculture, coexistence, welfare, intellectual property and corporate control, environmental assessment, traceability, monitoring, and even the question of necessity will come to the fore, and I think greatly amplified when it comes to wild nature. Now, while we still have some way to go, or we are raising the dead, in other areas, the science is advancing and developers are looking at, for instance, uh, re-engineering salmon intended for open water cages to help them resist sea lice infestation, a project that exists right on the borderline between agricultural nature and wild nature. Developers are looking at engineering a whole variety of plants for enhanced photosynthesis and carbon capture, at cloning to revive rare species, 
such as the black-footed ferret or the northern white rhino or the Pyrenean ibex and re-engineering re corals to resist bleaching. There are plans afoot to artificially engineer microorganisms and release these into living soils damaged by mining, pollution, and agriculture. And scientists are also looking at re-engineering bees to make them less vulnerable to pesticides. These proposals and more besides are at various stages along the R&D pipeline. But one development that has advanced further than most is the genetic engineering of trees. Now, there's nothing particular unique about genetically engineered trees. The traits that dominate uh, genetically engineered crop production, such as disease resistance and herbicide tolerance, also dominate work in trees. There's also nothing particularly conservationist or altruistic about it. It's being driven primarily by the timber and biotechnology industries to increase the productivity of plantation trees like eucalyptus or pine or poplar for industrial purposes such as pulp and paper and timber, as well as creating bioplastics and bioenergy, everything from wood pellets to burn for electricity to liquid biofuels. It's also being driven by the so-called sustainability industry. So for instance, earlier this year, a US company called Living Carbon planted almost 5,000 genetically engineered poplar trees. The trees, they claim, grow 50% faster and store 27% more carbon than non-genetically engineered poplars. And even though there's no evidence to back this claim up, the company has already started selling carbon credits off the back of this experimental plantation. And this is a really good example of how uncertain solutions to real problems such as climate change mitigation can pile up. So here we have the questionable approach of indiscriminate planting of trees combined with the unproven techno fix of genetic engineering combined with greenwash economics. There are no benefits here except for those collecting the money for the carbon credits. Most recently, genetic engineering has been proposed as a way to fix the problem of fungal blight that is plaguing on the American chestnut tree. And this work has largely been spun as saving an American icon, but of course the chestnut is also a plantation tree valued for its wood. And the engineering of this resistance trait has proved extremely challenging. Um, nevertheless, a field trial is due to go ahead in the US very, very soon, but at the same time, the Forest Stewardship Council has just announced that it will not certify genetically engineered trees, something that will undoubtedly have an impact on all those carbon credit profits and claims of sustainability. Trees are, in fact, a really good example of the complexity of environmental releases of genetically engineered organisms because the ability of a genome edited tree to function as intended and its impact on forest ecosystems will likely only be known after decades, if not centuries. And in the meantime, we have little or no ability to track or reverse the spread if something goes wrong. The questions around de-extinction are equally complex. These revived species have the potential to become invasive because the ecosystems into which they would be reintroduced are vastly different from the ones in which they originally functioned. What would they consume? What would consume them? Which other species would they compete with or even replace? Could they pose new disease risks to other living creatures, including humans? And you could ask similar questions of the removal of so-called invasive species, which have, for better or for worse, established themselves as part of functioning ecosystems. Every intervention that we make in nature has consequences. And as I was making my notes for this talk today, I found myself casting around for um, an example of this. And, and one of the best examples that I know of actually occurred in the pre-genetic engineering era in the 1950s on the island of Borneo, which was suffering from a malarial outbreak. The World Health Organization response to this was to deploy the latest technology, DDT, to kill mosquitoes that were the vectors for the malaria. The mosquitoes died, the malaria declined, but there were other unexpected effects as well. Amongst the first of these was that people's thatched houses began to fall down around their ears because the DDT didn't just kill the mosquitoes, it killed a parasitic wasp that had previously controlled the population of thatch-eating caterpillars. 
It poisoned other insects as well. And these were eaten by native geckos. And all the geckos had a, a fairly high tolerance for the DDT, it did slow them down a bit and make them easy prey for cats. And the buildup of the deadly insecticide in their bodies was lethal to the cats that ate the geckos. As the cat population declined, the rat population increased and the island was left with outbreaks of typhus and plague. And in order to fix that problem, the World Health Organization famously parachuted a number of live cats onto the island in order to control the rats. Now, we look at examples like this with a kind of detached amusement, but actually, in as much as it aims to separate problems from their root causes, the thinking behind the deployment of DDT is not all that different from the thinking behind the deployment of genome editing. Proponents of genome editing technologies such as CRISPR argue that they allow for a much greater level of precision than their older counterparts. But this precision is only at the level of individual DNA selection and insertion. It does not translate into precision or predictability or controllability at the level of the genome, the organism, or the ecosystem. The recent trial of genetically engineered mosquitoes in Brazil is a good point. There, developers discovered that against all their expectations and all their reassurances, the supposedly sterile insects were breeding with and passing on their altered genes into wild mosquito populations. Now, given the proposal to eradicate diseases like malaria and Zika, some might argue that the occasional unexpected result is worth the risk, but then this raises the question, who gets to decide which risks we should all take and how safe is safe enough? The use of genome editing in nature also raises unavoidable issues about how we define nature, how we value it, and whether as proponents of the notion of ecocide and the countries that have codified ecocide into law would argue, nature has a right not to be damaged or destroyed by human beings and that we have an absolute duty to exercise forecaring and foresight. During the passage of the Gen Genetic Technology Act, an idea of blurring the lines between technology and nature was mooted as both a triumph and a goal of innovation. The use of genetic technologies in conservation also blurs the language that we have long used to encourage and justify saving wild species and preserving ecosystems. And as such, it has the potential to alter the meaning and the weight of words such as nature, conservation, and preservation. It also provokes awkward questions like, if innovation can create anything we want, why do we even need organizations like the IUCN and the Worldwide Fund for Nature? And this question runs alongside the same lines as a very current debate, which is asking, if scientists and food technologists can make food in the lab, why do we need farmers? Uh, finally, for me, the, the use of genetic technologies in conservation also energizes some tricky discussions around patents and forces us to face up to questions like who owns nature and who or what is nature for and whether nature has a value outside of the services that it can provide to human beings. Our colleagues in biotechnology beat the drum for climate change in order to promote their inventions and argue that time is running out and we need to act now. We certainly need to act, but climate change is not our only challenge. Poorly thought out and poorly executed policy and planning decisions that pander to eco-modernism and business as usual are also a threat. Pick any other modern disruptive technology and you will find robust discussion about the necessity for precaution, the necessity for limits and boundaries, and the recognition of trade-offs, the necessity for a process of assessment and review acknowledgement of ethical, social, and environmental dimensions, and that persistent and pesky need for input from diverse experts, including civil society and the general public. This discussion is not happening in the world of genome editing, even though many of us, including those of us on this panel today, have tried hard to provide space for that to happen. Right now, as the law stands, we can introduce gene-edited trees into forests, gene-edited grass into parkland, gene-edited algae into our coastlines, squirrels, birds, and fish into the landscape with what amounts to little more 
than a spit shake agreement between the developer and the Secretary of State that it's safe and appropriate to do so. So as we begin to put the flesh on the bones of this skeletal act, it is my profound hope that we can change this and bring some of these essential elements back into a more productive discussion about what fit for purpose regulation means and what it really looks like. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pat. Um, covered a huge amount of territory there, um, which I get away from and summarize, but I think raised some really important points uh, about yeah, unintended consequences, the need for precaution, but also the, um, yeah, shining a spotlight on trees and other parts of our nature that, I say, to, to my having been sort of sitting on the sidelines a little bit for this, but haven't seen haven't seen um, many of those issues and aspects covered. So thank you, Pat, for shining a spotlight on those. Brilliant. Um, we've got uh, 35 minutes, maximum 35 minutes for questions, but I do know that David uh, um, does have to go in a few minutes. So what I'm going to suggest is that if there's any particular questions, burning questions people have got for David, do put them in the Q&A now. In a minute, I'll come to Ames and just see if there are any um, particular questions in there for David. Otherwise, I can um, fire in one or two questions myself. Um, but Ames, I wanted to come to you. Is there anything that uh, in the questions that looks, uh, I guess, particularly around process or around pets or around any, any other things that David talked about that you think would be good to, good to put to him? Sorry, there was nothing specifically for David. We did have quite a lot of questions on labelling, which I think David might be able to help with. Um, so maybe we could go to those. Sure. Okay. Um, we had, yeah, there was quite a bit of conversation on the chat about labelling. Um, um, I think Alice Moss pointed out that various various surveys have said that the public don't want, 80% of the public don't want labelling. Um, however, currently um, the, the, the Act does not um, mandate labelling of gene editing products. Um, so the questions are around sort of at a policy level, is anything still happening on this? Um, and at a consumer level, what can we do about it? Okay. Well, this, I'll put that to David. Um, and then I've got, I'll do a quick, quick separate question to David, and then I'll come back to the labelling question for the others, if that's okay. Um, so I know David has to leave um, literally in about three minutes. So David, do you want to just give a, a very brief response on, I guess, the state of play on labelling and what you think should should happen going forward? Yeah, so uh, so there was discussion, again, in the Lords um, on mandatory labelling. Um, there were amendments down. Uh, the government didn't accept them. Uh, their, their rationale, um, which you can see the logic of, is that the, the Gene um, Editing uh, Precision Bill uh, Act is uh, uh, provides for um, a, a process that would normally happen in, um, in normal breeding. And so therefore, there is no difference between the products of a, a gene edited um, animal and a normally selectively bred animal, such as Peter elaborated within his presentation on all the problems that can occur with that. So, so from their, their perspective, as there is no difference between those animals, i.e. all gene editing is doing is fast tracking what would happen normally by uh, selective breeding, therefore the products are the same, and so therefore there won't be mandatory labelling. Um, however, um, there, there obviously there is mandatory labelling of uh, GMOs, and this is where um, this is where the complications come with with Europe, because Europe still treats gene editing as a GMO um, and therefore uh, does not permit it. Um, but the, the UK has developed, diverged from that that uh, that position and treats gene editing as different. And um, and in addition to that, we'll, you will not be able to assess what is a gene edited product because there won't be any mandatory labelling. Um, and even those countries, and as I said in my presentation, Scotland and Wales have refused to do gene editing on their territory. But even in those countries, it will um, it will not be uh, likely that those countries will be able to mandatory label gene editing. However, the government is looking at mandatory labelling of other products, such as chicken, such as uh, pigs, such as laying hens on method of production, which obviously the RSPCA supports. So we we will just have to see this labelling is still a, a live debate. But but uh, but on gene editing, I, th I think the debate has closed. Um, there will no, be no mandatory labelling. Obviously, they they could be voluntary labelling, um, and a lot of this will be up to the retailers, to be honest, as to what they want to put in their stores. I think the retailers will have quite a lot of power. Thank you. And I know Pat wants to go on that. We'll let you come in a minute. Um, just because I know that David's got, we'll promise we'll come back to that labelling and let you come in in a second, Pat. But just before you um, have to dash off, David, just 
Um, very quickly on, um, there's a couple of comments about sort of designer pets. Uh, I guess how uh, how likely to think it is, or how how concerned should people be about sort of genetic pets? And then finally, is there one kind of call to action or thing you would encourage participants to to do um, in in this space that you think might make a difference? So. Um... If I had a, a scale of animals that I'm concerned about, I would agree with Peter that, that most of their concern is on farm animals, because I think that's where companies will make the money. And that's where they will try to uh, try to gene edit those those farm animals. So I think that will happen first. However, because the the act, um, as we've all discussed, um, doesn't differentiate between any animals, it's any animal under the Animal Welfare Act. Therefore, it is entirely possible if a company decides they can make money out of a gene edited uh, French Pekingese or a French Bulldog or English Bulldog, they are they can do that and, and they can they can then market that. Um, and uh, and the, the government was fairly dismissive of this in the Lords. They said it was almost like, well, we've not had any applications and we don't believe there will be any applications. But obviously, because the because the, the legislation is quite wide. Um, there is nothing to stop people doing that. Um, and in terms of your call to action, um, yes, the, 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 the act went through very, very quickly. And to be fair, uh, there was hardly any discussion on it in the Commons. There was a lot more discussion in the Lords, but we are where we are. And I think the, the, the power now goes to, particularly to the supermarkets, the retailers, and those that will put the products on the shelves. Because if they're not doing it, and don't forget, at least two supermarkets I'm aware of, Waitrose, and um, uh, and uh, uh, M and S, Marks and Spencer have already said they will not be marketing or putting gene edited products on their shelves. So um, I think that's where the action will be. Um, if you're a consumer, um, ask your um, supermarket what their uh, policy is, um, and then make your decision as to where you go and shop. Thank you very much, David. And I should say, my, I would always say this, we're citizens who consume, not just not just consumers, um, but absolutely so we, through how we vote and how we uh, yeah, uh, campaign and how uh, everything else. We have lots of lots of opportunity if we connect with the power that we all have. Um, I'll let you, whenever you've got a duck out, David, do duck out, but I will, uh, I'll, I'll turn in a minute to, to Pat and Peter. Um, I guess just picking up the, the, the question about labelling, Pat, and you wanted to come in, so I'll come, uh, let Peter come in, then I'll come back to Ames. But so Pat, on the, on the labelling question, um, you wanted to come in about Thank you. Yeah, yes. where things are at. Thank you, Dan. Um, there's there's a few things to pick up on, on labelling there. First of all, um, labelling in this country is incredibly complex. It's not just the province of DEFRA. It's split between DEFRA, the Food Standards Agency, and the Department of Health. And they, each of them has responsibility for a different kind of label. Now, DEFRA has said absolutely that it will not label we haven't heard much from the Department of Health, but the FSA has been going through a process of figuring out what it will allow and what will require a labeling claim. And it was really only in the last month or so that we've seen some movement on that. At the last board meeting, for instance, there, there, was, uh, there were some expressions of concern about whether there was too liberal a regime and whether we should be thinking more about labeling. Um, whether that was just for show or whether it is a real concern, it's hard to tell with this. A lot of this has been theater for the last year, but it's it's certainly worth keeping an eye on the FSA and, and how they might label, uh, how, what decisions they might make around labeling. Um, the other thing to say is that there were, I noted, and I'm not stepping on your toes here, Ames, but I noted a few question, uh, questions on organic. And organic links into the labeling question as well, because, and this is a really good example of how poorly thought through this legislation is, because as far as we have been told, where organic foods are concerned, these so-called precision bred GMOs will still be labeled and treated as GMOs. So in that part of our food system, they are still GMOs. Um, and that does protect the organic system to some extent. But you have to remember that these new organisms will not be labeled to the farmer either. And so it requires a really good traceability system. We have to know which organisms have been gene edited, where they went within the food system. So we need full traceability going forward and going backwards in order to protect not just organic, but the whole of the food system, the non-organic, for instance, part of the food system that simply doesn't want to partake in this. So although organic has some protections around it, those protections need to be strengthened by proper labeling 
throughout the food chain. Brilliant, thank you. Thank you, Pat. Um, I'll, I'll let Peter come in in a minute because I'm sure you'll have something to say on labelling and 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 and, and uh, related issues. But Ames, is there any other questions in there that, that are in that um, in that kind of bunch around uh, labelling and organic and um, public acceptance? Yeah, there was um, a couple asking whether organic farming is subject to this gene editing or not, which I think Pat has just answered um, very well. Um, uh, but Bill asked. Uh, how would organic farming avoid contamination of their operation um, with green edible products if we can't, if they're not being labelled and we can't be traced? Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. Well, we haven't got anyone from organic sector to, to respond to that, but uh, I don't know, Pat or Peter, do you want, do you want to say something about that? But um, not. Um, I, I can I can quickly. We're working quite closely with organic. Um, groups to uh, try and encourage DEFRA to understand the importance of coexistence measures, because at the moment DEFRA rejects that there is a need for coexistence measures. So it, it, it's operating on the, the perspective that there is no difference between so-called precision bred GMOs and traditionally bred plants. Now, I don't know anybody outside of a narrow range of biotech developers that actually believes that. And until we get proper coexistence measures in to into law, um, it will always be difficult without some sort of traceability, even if it's just sort of supply chain, regular supply chain traceability to protect organic. But but um, organic farmers and growers and so association are certainly um, part of that conversation. Thank you. Um, I will let Peter come in on, on the labeling question, just, just briefly, Peter, did you want to say anything about that hasn't been covered already on, on labeling and public? I've, I've nothing really to add other than to say yes. I, I think, of course, uh, you know, meat, meat and milk uh, from gene edited animals and their progeny should be labelled. You know, government endlessly says uh, on animal welfare issues, for example, that you know, it's important that consumers play their part as if it's the consumer's kind of almost fault <laughs> that we've got these very, you know, industrial uh, farming systems and yet no no food no animal related food apart from eggs has to be labeled in this country and therefore consumers can't really play much of a role um and so that the fact that the consumers are not going to be allowed to make any choices about uh whether they buy gene edit you know meat and milk from gene edit animals i think is a scandal Thank you. Thank you, Peter. So there's probably probably lots of people from the sounds of look at the comments. Lots of people may agree with you on that front. Um, just wanted to throw in a, a couple of things from me. One is about, um, and I know it's um, shame David's not no longer here, but the I guess just thinking about that, some of the points that David raised about um, I guess the, the devolved nations and about our and about I guess linking to trade and how this will work with. I guess of you from your perspective, Peter, or, and, and then Pat. What do you think? Um, what do you think, or what do you hope might happen um, that would? I guess there's going to be this divergence at the moment that we see. But what, how do you see that being being resolved? And, and what do you think the implications are for, for animal welfare? Because obviously there's lots of lots of trade deals being negotiated at the moment, and that people are talking about. Um, you know, our, our current standards that we have being undercut by. Uh, you know, by by some of the imports being lower quality, some of them being lower welfare potentially. Um, do, what do you think implications um, the Gene Editing Act, what implications will it have for, for that? You want me to? Yeah. Yes, go uh, Peter, yeah. Obviously a big problem in Scotland and Wales where the governments have said, no, we don't want gene editing, but because of the, the, the internal markets act, they can't stop. Uh, meat and milk and eggs from gene edited animals being sold in Scottish and Welsh shops. And as somebody who's for many years lived in Scotland, yes, I'm, I'm really unhappy about the fact that, you know, before long I might be going into shops and, and finding that some of what I buy is gene edited, but I won't know it. More, more, not necessarily more importantly, but yes, there's also the big problem with the EU that um, the EU will not want to take imports from, from Britain um from gene you, you know the, from gene from products produced from gene edited animals and their progeny so again this is going to create a kind of a further tension between ourselves and the eu so yeah a number of kind of trade related problems here 
thank you. And and Pat, what about trying to respond to that? And also, I yeah, guess bringing just... in bringing in what um is wild nature into this as well in terms of um uh, the the implications for um if if gene editing is um if we are having genetic trees whatever it might be um being being moved around um potentially um ship ship around country to country what does that again what what does that what are the implications of that um to to, to build on what peter said and I, I hope summarize what what david said um one thing to be wary of of course is that the european union is already um reviewing its own uh, legislation around genome editing and, and a big difference between there and here is that animals are out of scope in Europe. So if, if we proceed with deregulating genome edited animals and the European Union doesn't, that is a serious issue around trade and there will need to be traceability to ensure that, um, and I am projecting far into the future now, that genome edited animals in this country don't get into the European supply chain. Um, we, we have an agreement with Europe that we will not lower our standards um, below what they were before Brexit. There is an argument that genome edited animals are a lowering of standards, so we're going to have to deal with that as well. Um, in terms of wildlife, wild plants and animals, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, Peter, David mentioned something about the phytosanitary the sanitary, um, regs. And, and that I think would fall under that. We'd need to, we'd need to be able to identify um, any plants, for instance, that have been gene edited that are not allowed to be gene edited in other countries or in the European market in order to ensure that contamination doesn't happen between, you know, as a result of trade. So um, as I think David quite clearly summed up, there are thousands of different little pieces of legislation that have to and regulation that have to be gone through and aligned in order for any of this to work and none of this has been addressed during the the debates around this act the act has simply been put into play um on the recommendation of the regular i think it was the regulatory horizons council i hope i'm not um getting that wrong that recommended to government very early on that they simply deregulate and see what happens well we're going to now see what happens Thank you, Pat. Um, Will, there's there's a couple of questions in the chat as well, which I might save towards the end. But um, I think there's a, a question, Ames, come to you. The question about health, which uh, I might put to the panelists, but they, but I'm also keen to get. I know we've got lots of experts in our in our audience as well, so some participants, participants, if I can say it, uh, might want to respond to some of those questions. But there's, a, I think Ames, a question about, um, yeah, health. Do you want to, I think it was one of the one of the latter questions. Um, yes, yeah. so there's, Bill had asked whether anything's known about the potential adverse health implications of gene edited food for the consumer. The potential adverse, um, we, we talked a bit about potential adverse impacts for environment and welfare. In terms of human health, I think this is what we're talking about. Um, I know it, it might not be your specialist area, Pat or Peter, but did you want to say anything on, on that, the potential adverse impacts for uh, health? I think in terms of concerns around health, the issues are whether um, gene editing can create unanticipated toxins or allergens in, in our food. And because there is no mandate to assess whether that is the case, these could slip into the food system without our knowledge. I know we have several people um, in the audience today who have been looking at that, so it's a very good idea that you you ask them to, to kick in as well. But um, one of the reasons why we have been pressuring the Food Standards Agency to, to look at this issue of food safety, which is, which is their remit, is because of these unanticipated potential allergens and toxins. And what their answer is, is, well, we don't know how to detect those. But had they been working all along with civil society and the scientists who are developing these technologies, they would know how to detect them. But these experts were left out of the discussion. So it goes back to my, at least from, from my perspective, to my initial point, that if we want to find out whether these foods are safe, we can't simply take the say-so of the developers. We need to have methods in place to examine them and 
the, the, the people in charge, the people in power here, whether it's DEFRA or the Food Standards Agency, need to have that discussion and welcome those experts into that discussion. Thank you, Pat. Um, I'll, I'll, I've got, uh, there's, there's lots of questions coming in now, comments, which is brilliant. Um, I guess I wanted to ask um, a question to, to Peter, and it's kind of picking up on uh, some of what you talked about earlier and about uh, the need to change the conditions in which, improve the conditions in which, which farm animals are farmed, um, rather than sort of, again, paraphrasing, rather than sort of fixating or assuming that gene editing would somehow um, solve, solve the problems. Um, I mean, just think some of the, um, the kind of application things that are being talked about from, you know, address the, about the opportunity for gene editing for those that think there are opportunities like about viral resistance in chickens or addressing tuberculosis and mastitis resistance in cattle or, you know, um, uh, you know elimination of respiratory syndrome in pigs. There's, there's a whole bunch of, um, I guess, uh, which with, you know, with the intended consequence being intended to be sort of preventing loss of animals and, and economic loss as well. Uh, just wondered um, what you what you what your argument is to, to to the people that are involved in that and whether you think there is there are some applications that do have you know that do have genuine potential uh, or what yeah what's your kind of nuance on that Peter? Yes I'm certainly not saying that there is never a circumstance in which gene editing for disease resistance could be helpful. But I am saying we need to be very, very careful about this because so much of farm animal disease is coming from the poor conditions in which the animals are kept. There seem to be, you know, an increasing number of studies in the last, you know, peer reviewed studies in the last couple of years warning that these very large scale intensive pig and poultry farms, you know, are, are, are where future zoonoses will come from, even future pandemics. And remember, the last pandemic before COVID was the 2009 swine flu pandemic. Um, so, you, you know, I come back to the fact that the right answer that is to think about, well, how are we farming animals? How, how, th there was a, a study 10 or more years ago now from the Lancet Infectious Diseases Commission that said we need to develop health-oriented systems for rearing animals systems in which good health is inherent in the farming methods and practices rather than being buttressed they were talking about routine antimicrobial use or, but now we could be saying gene editing and so we need to look at the science and good practice to find out what are these health oriented systems we certainly have produced you know quite detailed briefing on this but it's to do with things like avoiding overcrowding, avoiding very large herd and flock sizes, crucially avoiding minimizing stress because that undermines animals' immune systems, making them much more susceptible to disease, ensuring that animals can engage in natural behaviors because if they can't, that's stressful. There are a number of factors there that will undermine animals' potential for good health. And that's where we should be putting our emphasis um, and when we've done all that, yes, we may still find there's some diseases that can't be addressed like this and where gene editing may be a helpful approach. Uh, but for me, we really should only be put, I'm not saying never, but I'm saying we should only probably permit gene editing of, of farm animals if, if certain conditions, three conditions are met. Firstly, that you know, de a, a really proper, careful analysis has shown there's not likely to be any adverse impact on health and welfare. Secondly, there isn't a less invasive way of achieving the objective. For example, developing health-oriented systems. And thirdly, and and for me, this is perhaps the most important, that it's not going to have the effect. This may not be intentional, but not have the effect of entrenching very industrial systems. And this is probably the core of my fear from a farm animal point of view that is taking us ever more down that industrial, you know, that we can solve problems through techno fixes such as gene editing, rather than being really thinking, how should we be farming our animals? You know, if we're going to respect the fact they're sentient beings. And I'd like to say more about that, but I probably shouldn't take up more time just at this point. Thanks. 
thank you. No important points. Yeah, what's the what's the problems we're trying to solve rather than starting with the technology and working out what yeah. uh, what they might or may or may not achieve. Um, what I want to say is bring in the last couple of kind of more detailed specific questions and then in the last few minutes take it to, to a question about kind of what can we do about it um aims i think there was a question that uh, probably for pat which was around something around carbon offsetting and tree planting i think do you mind picking that one out please sure so this one's about huge areas of wales and scotland are being bought for carbon offsetting tree planting will these countries have to accept the um gene edited fast growing poplars that you mentioned pat uh, no, Wales and Scotland at the moment are, are very much opposed to um, permitting gene editing of any kind within their borders. So I, at the moment, the answer to that is no. But again, as I said, there's a lot of theatre around this bill. And um, let's see. Let's see if they have to buckle to pressures of the internal market or pressures from Westminster or whether they will um, stand against it as they have really for, for decades. Thank you. Um, thanks, Pat. Um, just last, I guess, last, perhaps last question before I um, ask that bigger question about what do we do next and what should we do? Um, I'm just picking up from the comments myself, if that's okay. Um, the question from Susanna, which was, where are we, are we the science of testing, verifying, and identifying whether a plant, animal, or other organism has or has not been gene edited? Um, so I, I, there's probably a short answer to that, but um, does Pat or Peter want to come in on that? To your I, have, I haven't got any information on that, sorry. Okay, no, that's fine. Pat, anything you've got to add on that? Yes, I, I'd like to address that and maybe a tag on to it, Michael um, Rainsborough's question as well, because I think they're, they're, they're linked. Um, new methods are being developed all the time to detect gene editing in organisms. It, it simply is not the case to say that it cannot be detected. Certainly you need to know what to look for, but also I think there is a kind of um, resistance to looking for, for gene editing in food. Whereas for instance, the US government has recently announced that for the use of gene editing in warfare, it can use artificial intelligence to detect any kind of gene editing. So why are we more concerned about detection in warfare than we are in our food system? I think, I think that's a question that has to be answered. But the fact is that there are scientists all over the world working on detection methods for gene editing. And in fact, because gene editing is a patented process that produces um, uh, organisms that are also potentially covered under patenting, scientists have to know how to detect their edits in order to protect their patents. So it is simply not true to say that these methods do not exist at the moment they're expensive the more we develop them the more we use them the more that price will come down so i think uh, it, it, we simply cannot accept this kind of you know offhand comment that they can't be detected they absolutely can and one of the reasons why and this is where i'm coming to michael's question very quickly if i may um the government says that they can't be detected is because there is this misleading information going around that gene editing only involves cisgenesis. In other words, it only involves either um, transferring information from sexually compatible plants, between sexually compatible plants, or it's just a simple SNP. It doesn't involve transgenics. That is absolutely not the case. It has never been the case. And the government has actively lied about this throughout the whole of the process. Gene editing is a suite of technologies that can involve just a simple cut or just the transfer of um, material from sexually compatible organization, organisms, but it can also involve and does also involve the transfer of foreign genetic material into an organism. And the more complex the trait, the more likely that is to happen. And so we need to look at gene editing as, as a whole suite of technologies and be, be very careful about what we say in terms of, of you know, whether you can detect this because it's from a sexually compatible species or not. Um, so I hope that answers, Michael's, your question is quite complicated, but I hope that answers it a little bit. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. No, that's very good. Um, we've only got a few minutes left. I want to come, there's been a, a few questions and comments about this question of, um, I think, I mean, it's been at times quite a bleak, but, you know, stark picture that's been painted. I think, you know, uh, that's 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 understandable. Um, I guess the question about if I sort of 
um, slightly adapt the question, but the kind of is there a is there anything that's giving you hope at the moment? I'm going to put this to both of you, and then the follow on is what uh, what can or should we what can or should we do? And it's again not not that there's one sim you know, single thing, but I guess just for people that are uh, either you know exercised by this or uh, want to you know want to raise questions, want to explore this further, want to um, try and influence you know, the, the skeletal uh act as it as you know the secondary legislation whatever it might be what are the opportunities that you see for people to to do something so what's the one just to recap what's the one kind of uh, is there anything that giving you hope at the moment in this in this space and then secondly what can what can or should people people do in their, with their different hats on um maybe i'll start with peter that's okay Yes, as, as we've said, the government has made it clear that they're not going to bring the, the, the provisions of permitting the gene editing of farm an, of animals into force for something like three years, probably. So yes, yes, it can be done on the act, but those bits of the act are not yet in force. I think it's really important, you know, to, it, it's all the old things, you know, write to your MP, email your MP, email the Secretary of State at DEFRA saying, look, please, we really don't think is the, this is the way forward for, for Britain's farming. Just don't ever bring those provisions into force. Um, or, or if you bring them into force, it, it's got to be really with the three tests I talked about, you know, very, very limited circumstances. Equally, again, as been mentioned, you know, a lot of this is going to depend on the supermarkets. Are they really, are they really going to want to sell meat, milk, and eggs from gene edited animals? Um, we've already heard that two supermarkets have said no. I think right to other supermarkets saying, look, please don't stock this food. Um, on the more positive side, you know, yes, there are, so yes, there are things we can still do. Not all is not lost. On the more positive side, we, we, we've got to keep emphasising to, to government that we, the public, have got to say, what, what direction do we want our farming to be going in? Uh, there's been a lot of talk in the last 12 years or so, including from scientists and government, about the fact that animal farm animal welfare isn't just about preventing negatives, bad things. Of course it's that. But there's also got to be the opportunity for animals to enjoy a positive state of welfare. Things like you know, pleasure, comfort, fresh air, daylight, being able to kind of raise their own young, having a sense of control over their lives. Um, we need to keep emphasising that this is the way we want our farming to go. We don't want this suite of techno fixes, which makes it feasible to continue with a very kind of industrial model. You know, I, I, I put up as, as an extreme the, these huge multi-storey pig farms in China. There's a I'm not saying those will come here, but that's a danger of the way that life will go. I gave the example of earlier about the... Um, the, the very large litter sizes in sows and that the, the problems arising from that have just led to techno, very painful techno fixes. We've got the same, just to give one more example, and again, this is what I've got to say to government we don't want. We've got the same with dairy cows. They've been bred for these huge milk yields, and that's why so many of them never go out to pasture, because they can't sustain those milk yields from pasture. They, ha they have to be kept indoors, or it's certainly not easy to keep them indoors, to give, to give them the very kind of grain-based diets that they need to sustain those yields. So I say, I, I talk about this inexorable ratcheting up of an industrial, not just an industrial approach, but industrial attitudes to farming. And we need to be sort of saying to, to MPs, to governments, no, that's not what we want. We want a farming that genuinely responds to this notion that animals should have, a, that they're sentient beings, that they, ha they should have a positive state of welfare, that they actually might, will have good lives, even some pleasure in life. Thanks. Thank you, Peter. A nice, nice note of positive positivism. Um, Pat, in one minute, um, can you give your, your take on that as well? <laughs> okay. Um, whenever, whenever we say right to your MP, people roll their eyes. But I have to tell you that our our work over the course of this bill showed a staggering level of ignorance amongst our MPs around this issue. 
And so um, we, through, through our efforts, we generated hundreds of letters to MPs, which we were able to then follow up on. So, you know, don't discount writing your MP. It is actually really important. Don't discount pestering your supermarket. They, the super, I have less hope in the supermarkets, Peter, than you do. I think supermarkets are largely sheep. They will follow what their customers want. And if the customers make it very clear they do not want these foods in the supermarket, the supermarket will respond. Otherwise, it will simply do whatever government says is allowable. Uh, the thing that gives me the most hope is the complexity of this issue. And because of that complexity, the, the long timeline in which we may have to make things better. And I think we need to emphasize here that those of us who were advocating for amendments in the bill, were advocating to make it better, not advocating to stop genetic engineering, but advocating for sensible regulations and limits around it. And we will continue to advocate for sensible regulations and limits around it. The other thing that gives me hope is that the European Union as a whole has a much more active citizenry and a much more active civil society around genetic engineering. Um, and they are really pushing hard to maintain sensible regulations around genetic engineering and that will affect us. I think it's really important to note in this country that most of the major environmental organisms, organisms, organizations, they are organisms, um, don't even campaign on this issue. And it's been left to a relatively small handful of us to really raise the, the level of the discussion here. So I, I'm, I'm really grateful, Dan, for you to be hosting this and to help us um, have this wider discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we're out of time. So I just wanted to, by way of very, very quick wrap up, um, say thank you to David, who's already gone to Pat, Peter, um, and Ames too for helping. Um, I guess the message from me is, you know, it, it's clear that there are, there are lots of concerns and lots of unanswered questions uh, on this agenda, but there is still opportunity to influence it. Um, so do keep asking those questions, do keep getting involved. Um, there will be a recording this made available afterwards. Yeah, it's that, that question about, you know, whether you see this as a red herring, whether you see it as a whether we should be rolling out the red carpet to, or whether you, sort of it's red rag to a bull and you know you think you should stop it, people will have different views. But as Pat said, there is you know the door is open, but there is still opportunity to shape um that you know common sense protection, that regulation um that that is being developed, that process uh, and to to influence that um and you know all in the name of you know uh, of, of of you know healthy uh, healthy prosperous wild nature um healthy pets and uh and farm animals and and better food so a massive thank you all of you for joining um yeah do do stay in touch with the big conversation um and uh they'll, they'll share the recording afterwards and uh hopefully see you again thanks all